Today's podcast is brought to you by Blue Canary. The bird has landed on beautiful Bainbridge Island, conveniently located at 499 Madison Avenue. ASE Master Technician Clint Ramsey brings over 15 years of experience, award-winning diagnostic skill, and a desire to reinvent the automotive repair experience. Schedule an appointment online at bluecanary.biz or call them today at 206 206- Four five one four two two zero. I got something for your mind, body, and soul. I got something for your mind. Body and soul. You have found the Bystander Podcast. Now here's your host with the most, Tiny Tim. What's good, Podcastville? You found the Bystander Podcast. Your host is Tiny Tim. That's me. Here in Studio 15, we are doing part two with Eric Peterson today. Eric, how you doing? I'm well, thanks. We had a little bit of a faux pas in one of the mics killed, so, and we had a lot to continue to talk about based on our first discussion. But what you missed was uh, us talking about tipping to start with. Um, and we're going to get a little bit into a discussion around race. You ready to go? I believe so. Okay. Podcastville, make sure you be a friend and tell a friend. Go out there and support us on Patreon. Today's episode is brought to you by Sound Reaper Graphics in the Pavilion and Blue Canary with their new location in Bremerton. So, tipping drives me nuts. I didn't... Un- quite understand it before and i really don't understand it now in my belief it was always tipping to ensure prompt service now the situation is wages have gone up there's an expectation of 20 percent tipping it's at the conclusion of dinner there's also surcharges at times um where is the history of tipping where does that come from Yeah, it's something I've been learning more about myself and the confusion that you're experiencing, uh, you're not alone in. And I think it's emblematic of our time. Uh, We've entered into a period of of a lot of cultural change and it's long overdue and tipping is uh, one small part of it. Um, Tipping, my understanding is that... um, after uh, slavery emancipation, uh, the, that uh, lunch counters were a common form of restaurant uh, post-Civil War, and that they were dependent upon uh, black people to operate those ca- lunch counters. And um, re- those restaurant owners uh, were scrambling to... Um, try to maintain their free free or cheap labor, and they brought in the uh, tradition of tipping from Europe to America uh, as a way to postpone or prevent having to pay uh, recently freed slaves. And and Europe, was it uh, aristocrats or something that started it? Yeah, the aristocracy would uh, tip um, their uh, staff uh, when they felt work was being very well performed, and so it was on top of their livelihoods. Um, I mean, Europe has uh, a, um, a lot more... Uh, respect for service industry than America does. Um, 
servers there, at least um, it's not something I've heard about recently, but within my lifetime, servers have been um, uh, able to live a, a decent life on the income that they make in the restaurants that they serve in. And there's just a general regard for um, how food is prepared and how food is presented and the way we, the way humans interact with each other over food, um, that that's something that is valued more than it is here in America. And, um, and so post slavery, um, there was, um, uh, this, effort at uh, how are we going to pay recently free, freed humans um, and still uh, keep our restaurants operating and um, keep continuing to make the money that we expect to make. And, and in 1938, we had our first, I think it's 38, we had our first uh, federal um, minimum wage policy uh, created, and the National Restaurant Association uh, lobbied Congress at that time for an exemption from that minimum wage, and they were granted that, um, and there was, was and continues to be a disproportionate number of black and brown people who were working in restaurants. Um, and still work in restaurants, and that this exemption was, was really a continuation of that um, that post slavery or really the slavery tradition of of free or cheap labor and um, the uh, forty up to today forty three states and in America still have that exemption, and you will find uh, servers uh, across the country, not in Washington State, um, who are working for, say, $3 an hour, and then fully dependent upon tipping in order to uh, have any kind of a livelihood. But then you're, you, are, you are fully dependent upon the generosity of, of clients within a restaurant and so it's not a stable situation at all. It's also a situation that's prone to abuse uh, by restaurant owners and, um, and also uh, abuse by customers. Um, and so tipping uh, has a very uh, checkered past and present. And... Um, the complications that you've run into with uh, some restaurants is uh, tacking on additional fees to indicate that they're offering more money to staff is um, is a trend that started uh, maybe five years ago now, um, and. It is complicated, and I, I can totally understand how a customer is put off by that. Um, I just want to know what I need to do. Like, make it universal or clear-cut. Because the last time I went out to eat and had a problem was they came and gave the surcharge with the bill at the end. It wasn't like, hey, if you're dining here, you have this surcharge. So it was a surprise to have yeah. a surcharge for every person at my table. Right, and I understand a large party of eight or more, but we were under eight. Yeah. Okay. Well, I I myself don't go out to eat very often, so I'm not sure what what is happening out there. Um, I have a, a friend, Renee Erickson, who um, was one who started that trend of of tacking on an additional fee to. Um, customers at her restaurants um and that was about five years ago and and there was a lot of publicity in the news about what she was doing and there was 
communication about that to customers to try and educate people about what that was all about. And it was about trying to create a more sustained, stable living for restaurant workers. Um, the restaurant owners have that option of being able to add that, those additional wage costs to the price of your roasted chicken. Um, but then, as customers, we're looking at comparing costs between restaurants and one. That's why so many people that eat at McDonald's and fast food. It's cheap. It's really cheap, you know, compared to you go to, a, let's say, a sports bar and hamburgers, right. $16 versus two fifty at McDonald's. Yeah. Where's the majority of people going to go? So they have volume crap food. and Yeah. <laughs> the other has decent hamburger, but pays living wage to their employees and maybe sources it a little bit better. Yeah. And it's, I mean, from, from my perspective, it's really a, a, an American cultural uh, change that needs to happen um, as opposed to an industrial change that... As Americans, we have this expectation to um, get things for less and to get things quick. And um, it's become really kind of a national sport of sorts of, of how low can you go and what can I get for the least amount and how fast can I get it. fast, yeah, streamline this. And all of that, all of that is to the detriment of human beings. Uh, and to our environment, and to the animals that feed us, mm-hmm. um, all of, all of that is really an abusive system that needs to change. Yeah, I, I see it in the, the meat and poultry business, especially the poultry, where we've bastardized these chickens to get huge breasts, and they last about eight weeks, and they shoot up like they're on steroids, and then there's all the disease and the poor treatment of the animals and short life. Yeah, and we just consume it because. Boneless, skinless chicken breast is healthy. Sure. And, um, I mean, I get the appeal. I, I, I am a meat eater, and I have never made a lot of money in my lifetime, uh, relatively. I mean, if we compare ourselves globally, I'm doing very well. Um, <laughs> but if I compare myself to my Bainbridge Island neighbors, I'm, I'm not doing so well. Um, but that's the worst thing you can do is compare yourself to other Bainbridge Islanders yeah. and people to have this stereotype that it's all sweet and everybody's um, fancy pants is on the island and, and wealthy and well to do. That's not the case. Yeah. It's not everybody. It's not the case. And, and um, there is a culture here that uh, pre- kind of presents itself as being blissful and, and mm-hmm. almost Disneyland like. Um, and so any opportunity to raise the curtain on that stuff is good. Yeah. Um, so I went to Tahiti one time, and uh, the outside of the island was just beautiful and, you know, five-star, real expensive. But if you went five miles inward, it was poor as can be, and it was horrible. Sure. Yeah. You know, feral dogs and cats everywhere. And pe- there was one restaurant in Tahiti, one McDonald's restaurant. A person could work there all day and couldn't afford to eat there. Yeah. Hmm. Is it rough? Yeah, I, um, I, I mean, one of the reasons why I started my business was uh, because I, I wanted to be able to focus on um, the food that I make and the clients that I have, and to maintain and grow this sense of uh, care and love that I have for the world and. Um, to me, food is a direct offering that I can make to people that is an expression of love and care. And to be able to make money doing that is that's a, that's a good life. Um, and it does run counter to the expectations of the go, go, go of America and to make more, grow more. If you're not growing, you're dying, that kind of mentality. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and gotta, I'm good with that. Like I, I, I got to pay for my plot today, actually. I just got the bill yesterday. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I'm going to maximize every inch of my garden this year. Mm. Knock on wood. Mm-hmm. 
So I'm, I'm kind of excited to get out there and the day to be longer and the rain to stop and Me the sun to show up someday. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm taking my vitamin D, but it ain't the same as the good old sunshine. No, it's not the same. These it's it's always hard to get through the winters and and I can remember as a teenager feeling really depressed about it and um as an adult I've I've developed I don't know, uh maybe a uh um resources within me that allows me to get through it without so much depression. <laughs> I'm not going to go all milly vanilli on the neighborhood and blame it on the rain. Yeah. Uh, what what type of things have you seen? Now, the food industry has been hit hard through this pandemic. And then there's been the shuttering of so many restaurants. Uh, the Brooklyn downtown was my birthday spot. I always used to go there for oysters mm-hmm. on my birthday when I could. And they were an institution like 38 years. Mm-hmm. Thomas Douglas had 30 some spots shutter. Yeah. Um, there's some old time, very successful restaurateurs that, you know, had to give up the ghost. Yeah. So with the changes of the time, not only in the pandemic, but just the mindset of equality and th- looking through the equity lens, how do you see? the future of us coming out and the food industry changing? Is it just going to be like Donald Trump said, we'll build back better with these restaurants. They'll just be different owners. It could become that. Yeah. I mean, I hope it doesn't go back to the normal, the old, um, that I think the restaurant industry has always been skin skating on thin ice. Yeah. Um, there's, Restaurant owners, if you're an independent restaurant owner, there is a madness required, and that madness is attached to a passion. Um, and uh, but when madness and passion are a part of a work environment, then abuse happens, and um, uh, we see that over and over and over again in in restaurants and I'm not saying that all restaurant owners are abusive at, by any means I've I know and love uh several um but it is an industry that kind of exists on on uh on fallacies of of um ease and generosity at times um um I think I think again it's 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 uh, cultural changes our expectations as consumers um, that needs to change our our behaviors where we're expecting to be able to live off of the labors of other people for um, uh, afford quote unquote affordable rates mm-hmm. and. Um, and learn how to prepare food for ourselves and to to consume less of it um, and to be generally more mindful of of where that food is coming from, how it's prepared, and learn to like love ourselves and each other through food food making um, yeah to not to not get on the the old american um, uh, cycle of like power forward and consume, consume, consume. Well, I also think that needs to start in education. When I went to school, you know, I could take graphic arts as a sub course off campus. Uh, there was a vo- votech aspect to it. You could take auto shop, um, welding, electricity, all these standard jobs that we're short of now. I mean, I'm. My son needed a patch for his soccer shorts sewed on. Mm-hmm. I've taken my home ec. Mm-hmm. I have a sewing machine. I'll sew it on. Don't remember those skills whatsoever. <laughs> and that's a simple skill. Yeah. You know, just like cooking. I, I feel like a lot of people during the pandemic, they either fell in love, got a divorce, or a puppy, right? Yeah. I, I think we need to include either you learned how to cook or went back to cooking. Yeah. Well, a lot or of people you, have. Or you did take out forever until the money ran dry. Yeah. I mean, when the restaurants shuttered, people had to start making food for themselves. Yeah. And you had these weird little 
cultural um, uh, phenomena of everybody breaking, baking sourdough bread at home. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's fantastic. Um, but don't let it be something that's a result of a pandemic. Like, bring that into your lifestyle and change your lifestyle. I mean, we have the capacity to make changes when we identify problems. We, mm-hmm. um, we're John Perkins says something on a podcast in here. He's like, hey, pandemic, you know what it did? It gave you that opportunity to learn whatever you said you were going to learn, right? So I'm going to learn to play the guitar. Well, you've had two years sitting at home. Learn to play the guitar. Mm-hmm. You have your opportunity now. It It's up to you whether you... Put on clothes or keep wearing those pajamas seven days a week, right? Right, and h- how it affects you. I personally felt like when I could, when there was a group, I wanted to cook. Yeah, it's. I mean, you enjoy it. Yeah, I don't like cooking for myself at all. Mm-hmm. It seems like a waste. Mm-hmm. It's it's not as fulfilling as somebody going, "Oh, that's so good, yeah. thank you." Yeah. yeah, that type of stuff. I agree. I I prefer being able to share a meal that I've made with somebody. But I've also, over the years, uh, come to make good food for myself when I'm by myself. And it's, it's really, it's almost like a compulsion now, but it's in a positive way. I, because I, when I make a plate of food and it looks beautiful, like I feel better just by looking at it. It's one of those things that's related to my draw to the visual arts, I think, in the past, where there, there's a, um, something empowering um, about regarding beauty. And um, to be able to do that for yourself is a part of, of loving yourself, which is necessary for, for loving other people. It's something I'm still learning. But, uh, but I do think it's... All of this stuff is like just good, healthy, like routines to develop in our lives, mm-hmm. and it and it doesn't cost anything really. I mean, you'd pay a little more for food ingredients, but if you if you enjoy the way something looks, you take the time to enjoy its smells. Mm-hmm. Um, you are consuming things in multiple sensory ways and um, you're enriched by it without having to pay more for it. And, and, and so you don't have to go out to the restaurants uh, as regularly if you're able to enjoy and realize all of that within your own home. So you're talking a little bit about having a bit of a epiphany or awakening around race and the aftermath of George Floyd. Can you um, articulate a little bit about how you feel regarding race? Yeah, I can try. Um, it's, it's definitely a complicated issue that um, I've been uh, learning about throughout my adulthood. I think it's something I became sensitive to uh, in learning about uh, Japanese internment camps from uh, Bainbridge Island, um, and shout out to Clarence, I uh, developed my awareness and my intelligence on race in America um, when I was in college at the University of Washington. But Go dogs! It's something I've been. Uh, <laughs> I've been paying attention to throughout my adult life, but um, it wasn't until the 2020 uh, protests when I saw so many more white people out, like actually um, with some rage about the state of things that I felt like, oh, maybe as an Amer- as Americans, we might actually be opening our eyes to the reality of of racism. Um, and, uh, at this point in time, I, I think it's really important for white people to be involved in talking about race and racism. Absolutely. I think it's really important for white people to be educating themselves and their children about 
uh, the history of America that isn't told through white supremacy, um, that our dominant culture of white men is a form of white supremacy, and that most everything that we do has been touched in some way by that dominant culture. Well, when you say dominant culture, um, I think the saying is, history is written by the winners, the people that are left standing. So, so we get a certain version of history and not whole history when stories right. are told in America. Yeah, yeah, his story. It's his story, and it's not her story, and it's not their story. Yeah, and Colonel Mustard is not <laughs> given his version of the story. But but we're at a time right now where we have access to so many more people's stories. Um, yeah. And this podcast is an example of, of how that's manifested. And... Um, uh, one of the one of the benefits of the internet, um, we can we can re- research this stuff. More thoughts, more opinions. Yeah, and not and 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 to engage our critical minds, like to go to first person accountings, and to um, not look to just uh, um, the loudest mouth in the internet on the internet but to um um to pay attention to the black and brown bodied people who have had experiences with racism and to listen to really listen to what they're saying um that white people need to learn to like step back from from their dominant role and and listen and learn and um and that's not something that is generally encouraged in our in our culture where we're always needing to um get ahead and provide for ourselves and it's about me 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 um so for me that's what i am trying to encourage within my own family by bringing up the subject of racism um, and by meeting with a small group of committed people to uh, learn through readings and through discussion. And um, So you're participating in like a book club of Yeah, I don't like to call it a book club, but um, we're... We're reading something called My Grandmother's Hands by uh, Resma Menachem, who is, uh, um, he is a trauma specialist in, in mental health counseling uh, based out of Minnesota. And um, uh, his book, My Grandmother's Hands, uh, gained some popularity uh, before the pandemic, but um, I think more so during the year of 2020. And um, uh, he's got some really revolutionary ways of and thoughts and ideas that are in tandem with um, mental health developments um, with regard to uh, how, how um, the vagus nerve operates in our body um, what is that? I'm sorry, just stop uh, it. But. Vagus nerve is um, uh, a large nerve that runs from the base of your, um, the back of your um, skull? skull all the way uh, down throughout your body, touching on all of our organs um, and ending in the uh, digestive system. And um, it's a part of of contemporary therapies um, that uh, are addressing the whole body as well as mental health, and um, and so he's employed um, through this book a lot of study and exercises on how to tap into 
trauma that exists within our bodies and that the only way mm. to deal with trauma is through uh, physical therapies and mental therapies. And uh, it's called uh, somatic um, practices. And, uh, um, and he advocates for... Uh, this book is dedicated to race, race trauma, and he advocates for white people to uh, do their work together and for black people to do their work together and to not force ourselves into the same room to do the work because it's just re-aggravating old wounds. And that the idea that um, as white people we have inflicted trauma on black bodies and black bodies have uh, endured trauma from white people and that that's something that doesn't occur to just one person but that we pass on that trauma to our children and that if we don't take care of that then it's something that we impact other people by the way we speak and the way we act mm -hmm. and well we're modeling for our kids and um if you whether it be food or race if you're not eating the right things and you're out of shape chances are your kids are following that same lead yeah your child does not know hatred or racism. It's not born with that. Right. You have to teach him. And if you're modeling that in any way, shape, or form, they're going to pick up on it. And that's going to be their normalcy because that's, that's their pod, that's their tribe, that's the people that are most influential around them spending the most time. Yeah. And they're finding that um, it's not just, it's not only how we model and teach them but it's also actually in our in uh in our bodies the way that our uh dna um impacts our growth is something that uh, is passed on through uh, um in utero and you're saying if my mom was racist i would be born racist not specifically racist but that there is a um uh, there's a stress hormone. There's har there's hormones that um, are uh, creating stress chemicals in our body, and that if your mother uh, had been abused or was abusive, um, that she's um, she is flooded with the stress uh, chemicals, and that. Mm. That can't be healthy. Uh, no, and that uh, if if you're pregnant with that, then that's impacting your child um, to be conditioned for such stress uh, chemical action, and and so uh, that impacts how a body grows, and it impacts how a mind develops, and our expectations for how a life is stressful is is part of uh, what we're exposed to in utero if we're if we're if we're uh, in utero in a calm safe uh, uterus then um, uh, we're born with a body that's conditioned to expect a more calm stable life and and so we will behave accordingly more or less, very simplified. But um, uh, these are the kinds of things in, in contemporary science and how they're being implemented into our culture that, for me, gives me a tremendous amount of hope. And, um, and so, like, I want to see people spend, spending a time paying attention to that rather than the latest Spider-Man movie and, um, and talking with their kids about that. Um, like there's, it's really exciting stuff and, mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, let's, let's get smart rather than continue to kind of live in this fantasy and dumb down. Yeah. That's what I loved about Andrew Yang's, um, political hats versus the MAGA hat. He had the math hat. Make America think harder. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And I, I just love that. Um, the hat looked like crap. Otherwise, you know, I'm a big uh, trucker hat collector, but I, I just couldn't get it. But I love the theory behind that. For yeah. Sure. Think harder, but also uh, feel deeper. Is I, mm. I would also counter to that because I think in general we spend too much time in our brains and not enough time in our body, and that that's part of uh, of living a, a a loving life is is paying attention to how our body is functioning. Um, that uh, um, how do you think Bainbridge Island is doing? on the race front. I know since I've, you know, open, I won't use wokeness, but as I open my eyes around here, people of color are about 900 people. Um, there's a lot of, there's surge, there's, uh, the Wren network, uh, lots of the city council now has, um, participation in the race equity network. Uh, we've made, Signs around Bainbridge, all people welcome, different colored hands. Right. It's uh, now we, you know, the Bainbridge Historical Center has their pictures on the runway of um, the ferry. Mm -hmm. But I look at the school system and the teachers are pretty much all white. You know, where is the representation on the island of these people for daily affirmation? You know, I'm, I'm glad Brenda's on city council. I love the work that Chaz is doing. I love the work that Karen Vargas is doing. Um, but I think we also need daily affirmations. And what I mean by that is there's a commitment to understanding race. And I also couple that with homelessness and drug use as well. And here's how I do so. I make sure if I walk past, I don't walk past, but if I encounter a person of color, I make sure I make eye contact and I make hello. Mm -hmm. That's the least I can do. I've acknowledged I see you there. Mm -hmm. And I want people to feel like they've been seen. Whether a person of color, whether they're a woman, a man, a child, a homeless person, sometimes they just don't feel like they fit in. Sure. So they just want to be noticed. So I make sure I say hello to them. No, I can't help you out that way, but here's some resources that you might want to look into. I also carry granola bars in my car all the time so if i see somebody that's down and out i acknowledge them give them a granola bar and keep it moving but that's my little daily affirmation that i'm being conscious of other people do you have any daily affirmations such as that or monthly weekly that's beautiful i uh, yeah all of that that you just described I, I honestly, I'm, 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 I'm kind of a hermit because mm. I'm always, I'm always working with food. Um, and you were talking about painting for 25 painting, years yeah. solo, you know, and, and I don't welcome outside. <laughs> I, I can't, I don't know that that's a great way of being, but it is the way I am. And, um, and I can say that when uh, I I meditate most mornings and I prepare myself uh, for interacting with humans. So you win the morning to win the day? I suppose, yeah. That's my new saying. I'm trying to be more of a morning person, which I'm not at all. Yeah. I have become, so since moving to Bainbridge, um, I've become more of a morning person. That's because there's, there's less, less going on at night. <laughs> yeah. This yeah. town shuts down at eight thirty. <laughs> yeah, on the routine. It's Fridays and Saturdays as well. I, uh, for myself, like I definitely see growth with race consciousness in this area. But it's as you were describing. You had a great list of of things that you've noted that are more uh, kind of public displays. And I think there's a difference between public displays and uh, personal and private um, ways of being. And I think part of what I like about Resma Menekum's work is that he's really looking to each of us to do the work within ourselves 
And if we can do that in tandem with uh, the kind of greater cultural displays of of awareness and acceptance of each other, then then we're really starting to make some good change. And um, um, so, I, is there any big change that you would like to see on this island? Well, I was just gonna I was just gonna speak to something that I was really touched by in this in the last few months was um, a collaboration that happened between uh, Kitsap County and the Suquamish tribe. Uh, they they did this um, three part series called the Port Madison Dialogues, and it was something uh, intended to be. Um, kind of a more of a large group online uh, sharing of information by the tribe's leaders with Greater Kitsap County, as in regards to the culture and history of the tribe uh, from the tribe's perspective, and that so many people signed up to participate in that they they, they decided to record it and make it into a, a public presentation available on YouTube and the first two um episodes I'll call them for the Port Madison dialogues um were phenomenal it was it was oh it was really important uh to be able to um, get that history and that culture from uh, tribal members' uh, mouths, and um, and it's so different than reading a paragraph uh, on a piece of paper. Yeah, hugely different. Um, and and to me, like that that's one example of things that I've seen where there's there's this growth happening. Uh, from, um, uh, I want to say, both sides of, of culture, where you've got uh, white people showing some interest, some curiosity, some concern, and you've, you have uh, black and brown people with um, opportunities to be able to present that and um, and uh, another example is a documentary that was made here um, um, uh, what was it called it was my uh, shoot it was about um, the Filipino and Suquamish uh, relationships that took place darn it I'm not going to remember the name of it okay um, but but uh, yeah, it does seem like there's. This is a point in time in which there there is more um, concern on maybe the white half of the side of the equation um, to at least acknowledge and be interested in learning, and um, so uh, I'm I'm I just want to like encourage that. Um, however, I can, and um, since I'm I'm a fairly quiet person working away mm-hmm. in their in their own, the, an opportunity like this to speak with you um, uh, about it, uh, I wanted to take advantage of. Well, I re- really appreciate you taking the time to have two lengthy conversations with me, both around art, food, culture, and and race. I said both, but that's more than two, isn't it? Yeah. I do that often. That's all right. <laughs> hey, well, Eric Peterson, Island Larder, personal chef. Check him out online, uh, islandlarder.net, correct? That's correct, yeah. Um, if you want to start cooking with kale, the <laughs> Bainbridge Artisanal Resource Network, the barn, which Studio 15 is a part of, kelp. is kelp. cooking with kelp. Kelp. Fresh uh, kelp, not kale. Did I say kale? You said kale. Oh, because we were talking about kale earlier. Yeah, we were talking about kale earlier. If you want (laughs) to cook some great Seagrove kelp, um, check out the classes at the barn. Currently, um, it's a little bit up in the air, but I hope to do that soon. Kelp is a great ingredient. Anything else you want to toss out there? 
No, I appreciate you, Tim, and um, uh, keep keep staying engaged. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I hope to eat some of your food soon, and uh, hope we can be longtime friends from here on out. Great. You've been listening to The Bystander. Be kind. Thank you.